I'm here in San Francisco at a growth hack symposium organised by Mister, a food innovation platform bringing together corporates and startups. And the topic is biomass fermentation. We believe that uh, biomass fermentation has a huge opportunity, huge potential in the food system. When you think about creating great nutrition, when you think about great taste, uh, but more importantly, the ability to scale, and to scale not just in one location, but in many locations. So when we think about a decentralized food system, which we have to move to, this technology is going to be that major unlock. The beautiful part about the growth hack is our, is our opportunity to bring the scientists together from the large food companies alongside early stage. So in this growth hack, we had over 50 people from all over the world coming together in laboratory, working together on creating some of these solutions for the future. And I think there's a really uh, future for biomass uh, proteins. And there's still steps to take in the, in the development of the ingredient and understanding the application in the scaling. Uh, but this is a matter of time and uh, I, I think there were a lot of very nice ideas and also uh, nice to see that some of those startups are already in the phase of getting it implemented, getting it to the mark. Yeah, so I, I really see this new uh, opportunity of proteins as complementary to what we already have. So I don't really see it as a replacement. I would more see it as another way that can help us to provide the protein and the protein needs of the future. And what I think, that, so you could see it as complementary, maybe even complementary in one product or as a separate own source of proteins. And what is interesting is that many of those uh, sources, they bring proteins, but they also bring other nutrients. So it can uh, help to, to build a complete uh, nutrition. We believe that the food of the future is going to be manufactured uh, in the tank, as we say. Uh, it's the second domestication of species, some, some would say. Uh, it's very important to, to us to be part of this story. Uh, and uh, uh, it's more than a demonstration. It's actually something that is real. We believe that uh, the big manufacturers, the CPGs, are going to use those technologies very soon, as, as a matter of fact, many do already today. Yeah, so for us, one of the things being uh, an Asian-based company, the first thing moving to the US, we missed out a lot of us to have very rapidly connections with big players here and also with different startups. So the, the first value for us was to access an ecosystem in the US where we want to operate more. Yeah, I've seen some of them. I mean, it's part of the game. Some are very early stage, will be too costly for where our portfolio is. Um, I've seen today uh, some of them, they are already at a reasonable scale. The unit economics makes sense. Uh, but it's also where we want to collaborate and help them to go to the next stage. Well, it's a chance for us to get to meet all these new startups. And it's, uh, this is exciting. We get to co-develop with them and create new prototypes and new concepts. It's really about that and networking. So being part of MISTER is, is a great experience for a, an ingredient supplier. It gives us access to a lot of new technology and new startups and gets us the ability to have that peek around the corner. So the reason we chose biomass fermentation is because we were looking at something that can really truly disrupt the food system by bringing ingredients that can compete in the market today with current animal and plant-based protein. And that could be more a bulk nutritional solution versus some other approaches like precision fermentation that mm -hmm. deliver very good products but at a price point that makes them specialty still. So mm -hmm. to move a needle you really had to look at, uh, at something that could be bulk and um, if you look at the pockets of biotech there's really mm -hmm. biomass fermentation, precision fermentation and cremated meat which is even further down the line so that's one of the only way we can feed more people because we can only grow so many animals and plants. But I, I think that really a, a very large body of data suggests that it's very difficult to get returns to a plant that you can build, even if you're using quite cheap feedstocks, um, that unless you're selling a product that will be worth five, five or more is, is a sort of typical benchmark that we use internally. Below five we get pretty skeptical. There's been plenty of examples of people thinking that they will be able to make money doing that. and. The valley of death is, is difficult and if you haven't got enough margin going into it then, then a, lot of, a lot of companies struggle. Biomass fermentation can be produced between one and a half to ten dollars a kilo and I think this is really realistic. You think that some of the first 
biomass fermentation single cell protein product are actually going to animal feed. They need to compete with premium protein like fish meal. Mm. And the fish meal price have been oscillating between $1,500 and $2,000 a ton. So that tells you how much it is because nobody uh, in the livestock industry will pay a premium. So it's possible to grow at $2 a kilo um, and increasingly we might be going to, to potentially uh, lower cost. The first startups that are doing it in the, start, in, the start, in the food space, you need a little bit more uh, clean room than regulatory for to be food grade, so that might incur additional costs. And right now the problem is the scales are pretty small, so we expect economies of scale are those technology are being deployed. But uh, I'm really, really super hopeful about that. And we've seen a lot of different technologies today, ranging from white, tasteless, odorless powder that can be put anywhere to very uh, specific ones that either have red pigment with heme or that have a carotene that are yellow and have, fun have different functional properties. So there are enough different type of microbes and uh, single cell proteins to actually answer various problematic in the food system. So there's definitely space for everybody. So the MISTA role is really to open the eyes to the whole food industry about what's coming and trying to make a kind of a magazine of what's possible. So we really were driven by two axes. One was the type of microbes that we could be eating, so going from microalgae to whole plant cells to mycelium or yeast or bacteria, that's one driver. But the other one was the source of carbon that this microbe uses, because if you're using sugar, if you're using side stream or gas like CO2 or methane, it has a big impact on your scalability, your cost in use, the timeline for regulatory, but also the carbon neutrality. What we're seeing is the many different ways of using gases, so either directly or indirectly. We just heard today at this conference uh, examples of people using CO2 to make an intermediary, either a sugar or an acetate, that could then be fed to other microbes. So mm -hmm. we see a, a lot of promises in, in that space. What's difficult is that uh, a lot of those technologies are new. Um, to be able to put different gases into a liquid, you need to create some type of new agitation or distribution, and that often requires a new fermenter design, and that's expensive. Uh, we, we always, as a firm, try to encourage founders to look for where they're going to be able to sell their products first, and then build a product that will uh, suit the client, rather than imagining that they'll go through a several year process to bring something to market, and that the market will be uh, there for it. What we always look for in when, when, when we have our investment hats on is uh, what application development expertise exists in the team. For, for far too many startups, especially at the seed stage, there's very little application development. And I think if you're missing that, then you're missing the point. Because what we're really trying to do here is bring new materials to market. And if you're trying to bring new materials to market in the absence of application development, you're missing a really key element of the story. We tend to forget that out of these 10 billion people, the vast majority are going to live in areas which are not the Western world. Yet most of these solutions are developed and designed in the Western world. Yes. So it's important to stress on the economics, the feasibility, and uh, the use and deployment of such technologies in low-cost environments so that we can really start talking about producing the staple food for the population of the future.